So hello everybody and welcome here to this live stream of Sunday 24th, I have to watch 24th of uh, September already 2017. We're going to talk on Pachelbel, uh, the Hexacodum Apollinis, some variation suites and see how I practice them and get these pieces into a kind of format where they feel to you as a listener as a unity, at least that's what I try to do. So we're going to put the Pachelbel pieces in a little bit of context as well, talking maybe also on Bach and see what the influence is. It's really interesting to do that. I was thinking about this, that this week because I'm preparing to record the complete Pachelbel Hexacordum Apollinis to be released on CD, maybe this year or early next year. And so it's wonderful for me to dive into this wonderful music because that it is. Um, before that, two small announcements. If you see me here with a kind of thick cheek, there is nothing wrong with me. I just have uh, what they call in Dutch, and I believe it's the same in English, an abscess. I certainly mispronounce that word. Normally that hurts awfully, but luckily it's not the case, but I have to take some antibiotics. So I feel a little bit tired by that, bad, but also great for playing. Um, that's hard to explain, actually. Um, but all is fine with me, so don't worry if you think what's happening with Wim, that's just uh, normally this week it should be fine. Um, and before we dive into the Pachelbel and say hello to you if you're already in the chat, I would like to take a moment to thank my patrons on patreon.com because these masterclasses are kind of sponsored by them. And if you're not familiar with what patrons is, the patrons are um, supporting the things the creations, the production, and actually everything we do with Authentic Sound. There is a website, patreon.com, and you will put a link in the chat, and you can also check out in the description box. There are several reward levels and tier levels, so basically for even one cup of coffee, you could you can support the things we are doing. And the great thing about that is not only that it feels great to be supported by now a small community of over 30 people, but there is also a return. Um, and certainly now with the release of the online course, our first big course, so to say, on basic keyboard techniques, um, you get discount codes. That sounds really commercial, but that's how it works. And actually great to give it to the patrons. So also to balance a little bit what they are doing for authentic sound. So that's a great way to support. I would really appreciate it if you have to take a look uh, a few moments there. So other than that, to say hello to you in the chat already. I see Mikhail, great to have you here. Wadrian, oh, hope I pronounced your name correct. Good evening to you, Martin Slava. Great to have you back here from Arizona. Uh, Mikhail is here, good evening. And of course, Anya is in the chat as always. So if you have a question, don't hesitate to uh, write it down. And if I miss it, what will happen during the first 20-25 minutes if I'm talking on um, the story I want to bring for you then Anya will certainly give a summary of give me some questions of your questions if I miss them and otherwise you type them again if I read the chat. Philip Daniel hello to you as well. Okay so without further ado I suggest we dive into the content of this live stream which is all about Pachelbel and a little bit about Bach. So just to give you a little bit of context on these pieces, uh, Pachelbel lived in the southern German part, was of influence of Bach and maybe more than we often think. Of course, we think on northern German composers like Buxtehude and Böhm, because Bach uh, not only studied there in Lüneburg, and, but he visited Hamburg, uh, heard Reinken play, and he visited later while being organist in Arnstadt, visited Buxtehude. So the influence of the northern German organ culture was huge, immense. But we should not forget that when his parents died, uh, so Bach parents died short after each other when he still was very young, he was raised by his brother uh, Christoph and his brother studied uh, with Pachelbel. So he, Bach was, so John, John Sebastian Bach was all prepared to go to southern Germany also to church to study with Pachelbel. But instead of doing that, he chose going north to Buxtehude. But the influence of Pachelbel <coughs> through his brother and through the music that he uh, got 
Drew's brother is really immense. And if you think about this, variation sets here in the Hexacodum Apollinis, they are pieces that have a kind of, well, if you compare that, let me rephrase it like this. If you compare that with the Bach partitas, so the big, big keyboard partitas that I've been recording, I uh, have recorded in January, they are going to be released on vinyl uh, next year. There's a big difference because there you have the influence of the French music of the dances, Salamande, Courante, Sarabande, that where the French chord dances, chord dances have a real influence on the choice of your tempo. It's not always clear how much Bach, certainly in the case of Bach, take, took into account the real original meaning of those dances. Uh, to be applied as a kind of tempo guide. But overall, each movement in such a partita has a kind of unique tempo movement. There is not something that you let start with the tempo in the first movement and take that to the end of the piece. Such a thing you do have in these hexacodum Apollinis. And I'm going to show you in a minute how I am studying that and finding the balance so that really molds these pieces to a unity and which is really important to um, have the attention of the listener throughout the whole piece but if you compare these kind of variations of buckle bell to earlier variations of bach like for instance the organ uh, partitas they are much more alike these buckle bell suites um, for instance ogotu from Orgot. I've been I've recorded that a few years ago on the channel is more or less related to this hexacodum Apollinis much more maybe than to the later partitas which we also found uh, find in Buxtude's works that you have also these little suites Bach of course expanded on that but these suites where you have the Allemande Courante, so the influence of the French music, certainly in Northern Germany was very big, of course, also in the Southern part of Germany, but Pachel Bell still in the 17th century was influenced a lot by uh, Italians, maybe more than by French music at the time. So if, if we take, uh, I, I believe I have it here. So the Ogotti from Margot, then you will see, I will not count to play that maybe, maybe short passages, but there, if you practice that and if you want to perform that, there's also a kind of unity over the complete suite, over the complete partita. So you start with a certain tempo and then you continue. Let me find the Ogotti from Ogot here. It's been a really long time since I played that, but it's just to uh, give you an idea. Here it is. Yeah. So if you start um, the Partita by Bach. So you set in a certain tempo. And then. Let's see how that matches. so on so just to say that you, you 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 keep searching for a kind of basic fundamental tempo that works for all variation but then and we're going we're not going to dive into this uh, on notation because that would lead us too far from Pachel Bell but Pachel Bell you could say all uh, variations have a similar tempo even where he changes to a triple meter in Bach's music already, you will find uh, variations where you have this, and we've been talking on that a lot, these more dense harmo harmonics, more dense harmonic, of harmonic more 
dense texture, so to say, that suppresses the tempo, so that you come in a kind of adagio notation. That in the Hexacodum Apollinis you will not find, at least I don't think you find it. When Bachelbel writes 30 second notes, they have more an ornamentational uh, effect. They have not, they are not, they have not an importance that they really need uh, a special treatment so that also these faster no note values suppresses the tempo, so makes the tempo lower, slower. That's not happening in Pachelbel. So in, in one way or another, you could say that if you take Pachelbel's music here in 1699 and you go a little bit further to Bach, that's only 20 years later because these partitas are really very early works by Bach. Most of his organ work is just really early. Some of, of, yeah, there are some major organ works that are really late, but these organ works 17, I don't know from memory, but I think 1715 or something like that. So it's not, it's 15 years later than Pachelbel, but you see already influences that it of course took from Northern Germany, but also in the new style to expound the possibilities to influence tempo, basic tempo ordinario by harmonic density and by the texture of the fastest note value. That something is not something that you find in Pachelbel's music, not here. I'm listening to Anya, yeah? Okay, so Anya suggests I would have a look, and this is a great moment to look to the chat because we're going to play afterwards. Uh, Philip writes, um, would it be right to view these early partitas as expression as sort of cyclical form? I've observed that very often each movement is a variation on common melodic or harmonic material. I mean the dance partitas, not, not the choral partitas, which constitute a theme and variation form. Just Bach very rarely uh, varies the harmonic scheme in his choral partitas, unlike later choral, choral fantasies of romantic composers. Yeah, that, yeah, of course, that's also the nature of a choral partita, and this is more a choral partita than uh, a, the later keyboard suites, actually, which are the later keyboard partitas are also suites, but they have not uh, a similar harmonic scheme. Each movement is, an, is a piece on its own, of, uh, while here you have the same, often even the same bass part. So yes, I, I think there is a kind of unity. If there is a kind of unity over the six partitas, I don't know. I, I don't think so. The, the way of writing is very similar, but that's yeah, it has to do with the time also. Um, and coming in the 18th century, at least that's how I see it, compare just this music by Pachelbel to Bach, then the, the level of complexity raises enormously. And you see that in, in all fields technically and, and, and the field of composition as well. In fact, Pachelbel is pushing already very hard because if you see the sixth uh, suite, the sixth uh, variation is an F minor, so that's for 17th century practices a, a really very modern key actually. So he made, makes kind of the bridge between uh, the first uh, suite here, which works still great on the fretted clavichord. I've made a recording on that. And he goes to the last one and the later ones, fourth, fifth and the sixth. Yeah, you could actually say from the third one as well that on a fretted clavichord, that instrument feels maybe a little bit too small. Of course, you can play it on a harpsichord very well. Um, so yes, there is a kind of unity, but maybe more in the writing style than on purpose. That's at least how I think it is. Okay. So let's just give you an example here of the third variation. I'm going to re-record that. I've recorded that on uh, Thursday, but I have to re-record that because I missed something in the last variation, and I had only one take because we ran out of, of tape. But that's not a, not a problem. But when I just started to practice that, I actually uh, found the just to give you an example, I found a, a kind of tempo, and it is not too hard once you're there. But I explain in a minute. So I really liked the 
team, so the aria in a very or a rather slow pulse like this. Because the texture leads or can lead you to a kind of slower pulse where the eighth note has a kind of serious weight I would say. But then you come to the first variation, it's okay. That's still okay, then we go to the second variation. I don't know if you feel that, but now you start to feel a kind of, I would, a kind of feeling of being bored. I mean, this is, not leading anymore like in the because it's only arpeggios here and then I'm not saying that this tempo is impossible, but what I feel now is that this tempo is not um, giving you enough impulses to be very interesting. As and 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 then as a player, you start to need you start to you need to start thinking about how can I raise the level of interest. And for me, that's a point where you have to decide: a is the music not good enough? That's one possibility, or it's just, are your basics wrong? In the case of Pachelbel, I would never doubt Pachelbel. Uh, it's certainly Wim Winters who is wrong then, because the music, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, it's out of question. So then I'm going to st start searching and looking for a kind of new basic, not new foundation, where probably everything works better. And I was a little bit mis. Uh, led by later music um, certainly in such a first variation I don't know if you can see that there's a little bit uh, too much light for that little camera but if you see that it's all 30 second notes and so if you see such a texture in Bach's music then you will automatically I would uh, play the piece slower because that's in the nature of the texture going over the 16th note as basic note value means, certainly if you have such a dense texture of notes, means to suppress a tempo, to play it slower. So that was kind of gave me the confidence that my initial feeling of this aria playing it like this was okay. But of course, as we said now, going further, it led to a kind of desire to have somewhat more life, somewhat more vibes in that music so and then you start to play the variations one by one and cross each other so that you get this feeling of of you get this kind of middle um line or this zero line or this horizon line i don't know if you have to call that but this this point where you say this works for all variations and then it's a matter to level out to be to come very close so for instance Variation 2 is very determinative here. So what I'm doing now is just looking for a tempo. Of course, I've made up my mind because I've recorded this piece already, but I'm going through the process again. By the way, that's something I always do. 
I will never, but very rarely. Sometimes, of course, you have a piece of, that you play for 20 years and of course, then, then you know it very well. But if I practice it again, I will not or try not to remember too closely what I have dis discovered or what I've decided in previous recordings or performances. Um, often I will come to quite similar results, but the way to that result is always the same, always new. It feels always new. So also here, I just let go everything I, I, I know and it needs to level out again. But suddenly there are some lights here that I didn't have in the other tempo. And, and I think you can hear that there is sometimes a moment where you have this timing, where you have this accent, where you have everything in proportion. It's not complete as a variation yet. So because therefore we have to decide upon one direction and be very consistent with everything. Continue with the next variation. Works great. Four. Works good. I'm not saying this is the greatest performance, but I'm just trying to find this zenith point. And then the first variation with the 30 second notes, that's of course something else. That, that becomes very lively. Works great. And now you come with the triple meter. Very difficult. And that's really not ironically, it's it's really difficult to come from um, a variation with 16th notes. You have four notes, of course per beat and then you go to a variation where you have three notes per beat. That's really hard because if you miss that then, if you don't have this basic pulse anymore, then the whole tension is, is lost. Thank you. 
last variation. This movement, this tempo, works for all variations. And again, these 30 second notes in the first variation are for me something new. I would, in box music, play that slower because there you would have a different kind of context, as I was about to say. It, it's important to have the same tempo only harmonically. If you see the first aria, so the first, uh, the non, uh, not the first variation, just the aria. It's First notes of the first variation. It's exactly the same, of course. It shouldn't surprise us then. Variation two. Variation three. three. And then he starts to, um, uh, to uh, modify the left hand. It's basically the same thing. So. By applying the same movement, certainly from this harmonical feeling, it's a very normal tempo ordinario, by the way. Um, when I was measuring this before the recording this week, I am at quarter note 50, which is a tempo that works great for most of this, this music. Um, when you really are very steady in that and continuing to have this, this tempo, this movement over in every variation, then you will start as a listener and also as a player feel this unity as a kind of perpetuum mobile and that starts to go. Do practice that like I'm playing now. Stars.
You see, it's something like that, actually. So, uh, just reading the chat, there's something up. So, yeah. Of course, this in, in the 17th century, I, I would say I've played this first um, suite, so talking about the difference between harpsichord and, and clavichord. Uh, 17th century for me, it's, it's, there's more the spinet, the virginal, the harpsichords, not the big ones, um, more present than the clavichord, I believe. I, I just as a feeling, because I don't know historically, I know the fretted clavichord is some some instrument that has a lot of charm, charm and lot of uh, and and they have been uh, they have they have been built these fretted clavichords in the most uh, expensive and, and 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 way. So there is no doubt about it how important this instrument little instrument was. But still, playing the first aria prima, you will remember that. <laughs> On that little Christopher Clark clavichord that I was given a few weeks uh, in loan by Pat uh, Patrick Colon, the Belgian organ builder. Um, I've tried the other ones as well, but to my feel, such an instrument is difficult for the more virtuosic music that it becomes, like like. And I'm not saying that it's not possible. Maybe it has to do with key depth, which on these earlier uh, instruments like that of Christopher Clark is really shallow. I mean, and of course, if you have more faster notes, then you would like to have a little bit more, a, a way to um, deviate, I hope that's correct, your energy, because faster notes require more input in the keyboard than you have slower notes, obviously. So, and if you have a very, slice shallow uh, depth of uh, key depth uh, and like with many fretted clavichords then it's very difficult to play that music um, also with the nature of the instrument being fretted is of course difficult with fast notes but that's not the major problem so i don't know where this music was played on the most uh, for sure harpsichord um, on the other hand um, i don't know if the, the title page I was looking on that. It's talking about keyboards and 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 clavicembalos. It's this one. That's the original print, and it shows well a kind of clavichord, I would say. The first unfretted clavichords, like the one I'm playing on, but a little bit smaller than, were documented exactly in that time in that period. So. Um, and on the organ as well, um, this is still considered, maybe not the Hexacordum Apollinis, but many variation series from Pachelbel were great on the organ and are often played on the organ more than on the keyboard instruments. Since, of course, that's, that's a wonderful opportunity. Also here, this is a, year, this is a 70s edition of uh, Pachelbel. You see the, uh, here, for instance, you see the advice on registration, which is, for that time on neobroke organs, but it doesn't work on a historical instrument. It's often played on organs, but I wonder if it, yeah, it says in the title page that it could, can be played on an organ. But I wonder with the temperament, what, what to do with F minor in that time. Most of the organs, smaller ones that are in southern Germany, 
for sure had, if not mean tone, then a very uh, old temperament. So there's no way you can play F minor on that. So, and I don't think there has, has been done a lot of research on that. We play it then on, on harpsichord and the clavichord. It's a little bit left be, behind. But I think that the importance of the instrument, like we know it as an unfretted instrument, might as well have uh, been raised in, in, in southern Germany with people like Pachelbel. But again, that's something uh, we should think about. It's more in the future. It's just a mindset. If you, uh, it's with all historical facts. And, and sources like that, that, that's the reason why everything, according, as I believe, is very relative, what we say and what we think, because the perspective you take in reading those old, old sources is so important. Um, it changes everything. I've done, I've said that once, but with the tempo research on metronome numbers, just shift your focus once and the world opens. Doesn't mean that you have to stay there, but it gets you thinking. And it's, it's very natural and very human-like that we take something we know and we stay there forever. But that's in, in our historically informed performance practice niche or branch, it's, it's, it's of course, uh, it kills you. I mean, and it, I mean mentally, of course, uh, because it has been, it's, this is 300 years ago, I mean, even longer. And, things change so much so changing your perspective while diving into the historical sources is, is imperative and also to the investigation research on keyboard uh, use of keyboards today we still live in a time it's changing but still uh, if you talk to people in the historical informed performance practice on clavichord they always say great yeah great instrument but in reality there has not been done so much research, if any, where the clavichord as a real uh, elite kind of power instrument, like I'm playing the Bach partitas and Mozart and Beethoven, is taken seriously into consideration. Because if you do that and you start reading the sources around Bach again, then again, your, your perspective changes. Then suddenly the clavichord becomes much more important than we today believe it is. So. Uh, there is so much to be done and that's that's the interesting part and uh, everything we do is relative i believe and um, just before i dive into the fifth uh, the aria quinta is very new to me so we go to the same process there uh, about this karl richter performance that i shared with you uh, through one of my vinyl discs yeah the reactions were I, I'm not going into detail, but sometimes very surprising to me. We, of course, that's a different performance. And if you don't like it or not, I mean, I can imagine that some people who have been raised with this kind of Ton Koopman generation with more over the top sometimes expressiveness, but that's okay. That they say, well, that's this kind of so rigid way of playing. But to connect then another thing and that of course you live in a time of opinions and they are shared so easy on, on social media but we have to reflect on that because if you then say well richter was wrong and we are right i literally read one comment where some a player a great player by the way was asked are you done that afraid that your own performance will be judged in 30 years as you now are talking on Karl richter and he said no i don't think so because we know how to play bach and that's something that we should be very careful about because we make beautiful performances. That's what we do. But in the middle of behind the curtains is our research. And there are so many perspectives possible on performance, on tempo, on articulation, on character, on effect, on instrument choice. And it changes all so much. And that's fascinating. I think we should keep that window very open and and, and that Karl Richter performance for, for me was, was mind blowing. I didn't know it, him at all. Nobody told me who Karl Richter was. It's, I feel very stupid now if I dive in a little bit to his, his, his life and history, but that's how it is. Um, but listening to the Goldberg variations, of course, that's an instrument type that we say, well, of, is that a harpsichord? 
but on its own he makes music with that in a very rigid way not emphasizing anything almost but that's how he wanted as a reaction on on what was before but he does it with so much power with so much ease which which he, that the result you get is exactly what he wants and then of course you have a new generation with with, with leonard also making recordings before Karl Richter, but open to to, to yeah, maybe Conton Kopan is a kind of um, the other corner. I mean, that's the total opposition of, of Karl Richter. And then it goes back a little bit. I mean, it, you, it learns you to have your both feet on the ground and learn and, and, and enjoy the performances without judging them all the time. That's actually what I want to say. And, and and be aware of the fact that it's not an easy it's not easy matter but it should not prevent of, prevent us from enjoying each other's performances even if it's sometimes different like in Karl Richter's case okay there we go to the um yeah Alexi writes harpsichord is too dull and square mm, it depends on <laughs> I mean you can play very expressive on a harpsichord if you l listen to for instance, uh, Gustav Leonard, but also there will be, not this week, but one of the coming weeks, Helmut Waldherr with the World Temperature Clash. Yeah. Um, he was being taken on already in the same posts on Karl Richter, but what he does with the harpsichord is amazing. He makes it, he's, he's singing. What the clavichord has an advantage on the harpsichord is that you have these dynamic possibilities and that's really something really important. And also for an audience, it's you can I think you can listen longer to a clavichord than to a harpsichord because it's kind of similar, but you can play very expressive on a harpsichord. Um, so again, let's dive into the Aria Quinta, which is a brand new work. I made fingerings uh, it's Sunday, this morning actually. It's not too difficult music either, but let's see where we come. And I must say, once you have such a tempo feel, such a kind of tempo ordinario feel for this kind of music, it's applicable to, to many pieces. You sometimes slow down a little bit, go a little bit faster, but overall you're, you're good to go for a lot of pieces in, in this Hexachordum Apollinis. You can try it at the end. So if we just take the same tempo, we have this. Let me let me concentrate let, uh, just a little bit. A little bit faster. out of the context but talking about clavichord and the power just like I did on the on this one. it gets silence then between the E and the F and that's great power that you only have on the, on the clavichord there's no other instrument that can give you that and playing that kind of using that in in a live concert also on the recording of course but the recording you lose something but in a, but a, in a live concert you feel the room um, becoming very silent even i've played concerts where i shouldn't be with my clavichord in, in in a church next to a very busy road which with, with a door that even doesn't close so there you have all these cars and still you you get that silent feel over the people See how this works with the variations. There we have the 30 second notes again. Mm -hmm. 
it would be too fast for me if I would not be able anymore to very f uh, fine articulate these 30 second notes. It would be something. That it needs down. Pa -pa -pa -pum -pum. Which is on this instrument very difficult because also here in the middle I need to ask Yoris to have um, a look to that. The key depth in the middle has become a little bit more than in the top. And you feel every tenth of a millimeter on a clavichord. You can, it's really true. Uh, we did often, Yoris and I, the, uh, the test and he had a new instrument and said that's, that's a key depth that's more than mine. And he said it's not it's exactly the same. And then we start measuring and one and two tenths of a millimeter is really easy to find. it's not it's not that i feel it as as the only one it's just easy to feel so this is a little bit more difficult here now for me here So for me, these 30 second notes are a little bit on, 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 on the edge of being too fast because I want to have them very clear. Now also to do with, with the kind of uh, technique, it's, it's very fresh music now for me, but it doesn't matter. I mean, it's just technical. <laughs> But on the other hand, it feels very powerful. And that's what this, this, this is very early in the variation that he uses these second, 30 second notes. It's really a big contrast between, uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the aria. Works great. Also here, if you have this left hand, you still have the feeling that you can play it very comfortably. Then the tempo is okay. And going very soft. To make this contrast.
So that works great, and again, 16 notch. So I think that tempo works great and I believe it's not very far off from what we had in the F major. So it's all around the second, a little bit slower. First aria, let's try that same tempo. something like this. Okay. Works great this tempo. So for the first one is no problem, second one. This one is on the channel already, I think. So the, the, the bottom line is here that this Tempo Ordinario, this second, which was at this time a little bit modern. Um, if you compare that to music by Swirling, you have still this more often this half note pulse. Here you have a quarter note pulse. 
uh, which, which is around a second. Second, again, something is a little bit slower here. And the main thing is that this, this gravity, this point of gravity is a quarter note. And if you have that, you can, of course, play a little bit faster, a little bit slower. Um, you have, of course, margin. We are all a little bit different, but that's, that's the bottom line. And that's the way I, how I practice these pieces, uh, these sweeties from Pachelbel and mold them, get them to a unity. And it's really, 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 really important. The, 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 the idea behind is not difficult, but the performance, the execution is, well, if you perform it or record it, it shouldn't be difficult anymore. But in order to come there, that you have with each variation, the, the certainty, absolute certainty that you are following this, this pulse, even going to triple meter, that takes a while, a little bit of experience. And, but it is crucial to, to have these pieces as a unity and have them work in a way that if you listen to them, afterwards you feel, wow, this, is, this feels like something I can take, I can grab, I can take, put in my pocket and walk home. And that's, that's how this should feel. So again, I hope you uh, and, um, take something from this. If there is a question still, uh, I'm still here. So on the, to answer that, if you would like me to uh, have a look at certain details. Um, and again, as I said at the beginning, this is all study for the CD recording. Already the fourth one has been recorded on Thursday. I will insert some more recording sessions. Um, the, the Thursdays will stay. So every two Thursdays, but I will insert a little bit more. If you check on the channel on the homepage, on your YouTube homepage, or just go to Authentic Sound, you will see on top um, perhaps new live streams and you can click on set reminders. So if you want to attend that, it's always great to have you then. Because I'm going to record the Pachel Bell. I am about to record some of Costa's music. So there's a large, a big sonata in A major waiting for a long time then we are almost finished with his six quote-unquote easy sonatas but i want to have the score printed before i record that clementi sonatines are waiting uh, and some other music so you check the channel if you would like to uh, attend some of those extra sessions if there are any because this week i have a lot of appointments going to Haarlem, by the way talk about the bach festival in leuven with a big organ going to the Haarlem festival talk with the director there and Alkma festival so i will be very close to the big muller organ if, if i have time i slip in the charge and make a picture for you okay <laughs> john asked john writes yummy i guess you uh, mean the harlem organ yeah i played that organ quite a lot when i was in amsterdam also in alkmaar the big organ and would love to take you with the camera uh, in Alkmaar and that's just to finish this live session in Alkmaar you have the big Schnittke organ and if you see those organs on picture that's there are so well pro the proportion is so well done that that like in like I was talking you can you of, almost can grab those organs but they are really big and once the Voximana needs tuning and still Hans van Iepkoop was organist so that's in the 90s somewhere and he took me up to the Bovenbeck but then you have the facade pipes of the principal eight and there is nothing I mean there, you're just standing there and there is about almost 25 meters nothing I mean so huge it's incredible once I take you there okay virtually with my camera okay guys I Hope you enjoyed this session um, and take something from it with Pachel Bell. For me, Pachel Bell is really just not a discovery, but I like his music more and more. I'm really glad that it was Andy, I think, who suggested me to do that and that I'm doing that. So, hope to see you soon again. Next masterclass will be in two weeks. Maybe we do something differently. And next official recording session will not be on Thursday but Thursday after that and maybe some others in between okay thanks for watching and see you soon again bye